Good evening and welcome to HCPL Writes. Since we are just getting out of NaNoWriMo mode, this month we're going to talk about the process of editing your draft. Now there are so many ways that it can be done and no one way is right. And because of that, tonight I'm gonna to be joined by a panel of fellow authors and we're going to discuss the many different ways that we edit. Um, in just a moment, we'll start off with our introductions so our audience will get to know everyone. And um, we're going to go around the group so everyone will get to hear the author's name, the genre that we write, and where we currently are in the writing process. Um, so many of our regular viewers know me. I'm Amy Campbell, the branch manager at the Catherine Tyre at Bear Creek Library, and I'm also an author. I write queer, weird, western, epic fantasy because I can't pick a lane to stay in. And this program is very timely because I'm currently editing my third novel. So now let's meet our other authors. All right, we're going to hear from PD Workman. Well, hello, everybody. I'm glad to uh, be here this evening to chat with my other authors and uh, go over some of the editing stuff with you. Uh, I write under PD Workman. My name is Pamela. Uh, I currently have 77 books out. Number 78 releases uh, this Friday. It's a medical thriller called Gentle Angel and is book number four in my Kenzie Kirsch series. And that's it for me. Very cool. Um, so next, let's hear from Russell. Hi, I'm Russell Nolte. I'm a USA Today bestselling author. I write fantasy. I've written 37 novels, a bunch of comics, some kids books, and a whole bunch of other things over the years. Well, thank you for sharing, Russell. We're glad to have you with us. All right, next, let's hear from Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Kramer. I am a USA Today bestselling author. I just published my 16th book. I write all fantasy, uh, different kinds of fantasy, but I just published my 16th book, which is a weird Western loosely based on the Pony Express, but it has magic. That's a lot of fun. All right, let's hear from Terilyn now. Hi, I'm Terilyn Mitchell, and I write, um, sorry, I write romance, so adult and new adult, as well as I write fantasy under a pen name T.S. Mitchell. And I have two books or three books out now. Wonderful. And last but not least, let's hear from Matthew. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Wayne Selznick. I have been an independent author and publisher since whew, 2005. And since uh, 2011 or so, a full-time creative services provider helping other authors bring their works to fruition, to market, and to an audience. Um, my First book was the Amazon best-selling Parsec Award-nominated Brave Men Run, uh, which has the distinction of being the first novel in history with a simultaneous release in paperback, various ebook formats, and free podcast edition. Of course, that took over for a little while there, and you'll find a lot of books on podcasts now, and of course, audio books. Uh, my latest work is a fantasy thriller sort of a genre matchup, which seems to be going around the room a little bit here. Um, Light of the Outsider, which is a uh, wholly original sort of no elves, no dwarves, original fantasy setting. Uh, and uh, yeah, kind of if George R.R. R. Martin and James Elroy got together and wrote a, wrote a book and abandoned it in the woods for others to find because it's too much for them. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a lot of fun. So we have a wide variety of genres represented, so that's really awesome. So pretty much any kind of writer will be able to hopefully get something from our little fun group here tonight. Um, so thank you all for joining us. It's going to be a lot of fun. So now we're going to dig into the real reason that we're here to discuss the editing process. And we do have uh, viewers watching us on Facebook or YouTube. So if you are watching and have any burning questions, please go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll try to get to them when we can. And uh, now we're going to talk about the different ways we edit. And it's going to be very conversational, um, going to be a lot, a lot of fun going back and forth. So anyone can chime in when they want to. We can riff off of each other. It would be a great time. Um, and let's also talk about, because I know we have some plotters and panthers here, we need to be sure and talk about how that factors into our editing, because I know that that can really uh, change our editing process. So who wants to tell us about the way you edit first and if you're a plotter or a pantser? 
as okay, long I choose as I'm going to do what I always do. <laughs> You're my Pokemon. Go. <laughs> I'm sorry. There was over talk. What? what? Oh, go, go ahead, Matthew. Oh, all right. Uh, well, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think we are all planners and we're all pantsers. It's really a matter of when you do what. Uh, for uh, most of my work, definitely for my longer works, I'm uh, a planner. Uh, I tend to uh, work out the outline down to the beat level ahead of time, uh, kind of creating a draft zero, um, which I find just saves time because then I'm not chasing myself during the manuscript draft and you know spending that time on thousands of words that uh, might otherwise yeah, not need to be used. Um, <laughs> With shorter works, I still tend to plan, uh, maybe not as tightly, but I always have an end in mind. And, uh, you know, once you kind of have the X on the map, you have the map and you have the X. It's just a matter of getting through to uh, from one place to the other. Um, so, yeah, as far I mean, you asked, it was sort of a two part question, correct? Uh, whether right. Well, first, if you are a plotter or a pantser and then kind of how your editing process works based on that. Right. Um, well, a lot of the editing happens in that planning stage because you're working out all the interactions between plot and character and theme and tone and setting. And, uh, you know, any issues that might come up later, you've already sussed through uh, in the planning stage. Um, my, so my, my draft zero tends to be, you know, several tens of thousands of words of outline and character study and uh, any other notes I might need. When it comes time to write, that first draft tends to be pretty clean. That said, <laughs> um, the first editing phase, I mean, I go through several editing phases. Uh, the first thing I'll do is print a, phys a physical copy um, to put it into a different, uh, a different medium, literally, so that my eyes are seeing it fresh for the first time. And it's old school, red pen going through, uh, you know, 12 point, uh, Sarah font, double spaced, inch line, inch uh, margins all around, manuscript format, and just going through and um, fixing whatever leaps out at me in that stage. Go through that, transcribe that into a new electronic draft, uh, and then uh, it's another run through for you know what I call sort of the Mad Libs draft, where anything that I have put TK TK TK, meaning you know to come for those who aren't familiar with uh, the, the abbreviation. Anywhere I find that in the manuscript, now it's time to do whatever little world building I might've put off, somebody's name that I, you know, for an unimportant uh, tertiary character that comes and goes, figuring out a name for them, all those little details that need to be thrown in. That's that draft there. Um, depending on what some of those details are, that can be a, a pretty big digression, especially for some of the world building stuff, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a risk to get down too deep into world building, always serve the story, but, uh, but that can take some time. Uh, and then um, there's a copy edit somewhere in there, but I usually leave that till last. But one of the uh, close to last things I'll do is since I record my own audio, I will use the audiobook recording as another draft pass before I do ebook, before I do paperback, because I'm reading it out loud, again, there, there's literally a fresh voice to look at the manuscript, really hear, especially dialogue, how things are going to sound. Does it read naturally? Um, when you're in that audio phase, and anybody can do this, whether you're uh, recording an audio book or, or, or not, you should, reading your work out loud is probably a tip that we would all uh, advise on, yeah. uh, because mm -hmm. you can if you're faithful to what you've written, in other words, the proper pause where there's a comma and the, <laughs> the longer pause and treating the punctuation uh, as uh, you know verbatim, you'll hear it when you read it out loud. And uh, that's where a lot of changes and a lot of refinements can come in, into place and where a lot of the art tends to get painted over the craft that's already in place. Um, and then a copy edit and then laying out the ebook and the paperback and doing proofreading runs on those. and uh, Hopefully, <laughs> that's it. Uh, once it's published, there may be, uh, you know, hopefully readers who are the best eyes we could possibly have uh -huh. will email now and then and say, yeah, you might you missed this thing or you missed that thing. And uh, and that's always welcome, you know, and uh, fix that. So, yeah. So that that should make all feel better that even with all of your experience that you still have 
uh, readers that, you know, email you like, oh, you, you know, forgot this or that. Pick up any book. Something. Yeah, pick up any book at Barnes and Noble and, you know, you will find at least 10 or 12 uh, errors. Uh, there's, you know, if you can get even a professional copy editor, if, you, if they bring back your work and if you're at least a 60,000 word novel, three, four, five things they missed, that's really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, so I thought it was interesting that you do your, some of your world building that far into the draft. Um, do you have, like, is, is that like the small details of the world building or is it like big things like, oh, I need to have this faction in the book now too? Oh no, it's it's small stuff. Like, you know, I'll, I'll write a note for myself, like, uh, uh, you know, figure out what this would be. <laughs> and it might just be something as simple as, as what does this particular culture call this thing that mm -hmm. you and I have a word for, but because they're not on earth, they're not us, what would they be calling it? You know, little things like that or, or working out, you know, uh, sometimes just doing small sketches uh, or small maps just for my benefit to almost uh, almost like a football playbook diagramming out, especially fight scenes and things like that to make sure, okay, does this actually make real sense? Or, you know, have I written them into doing some physically impossible stuff? Things like that. Fight scenes are fun. I'm a black belt in Taekwondo and it's awesome to do fight scenes. It's really fun. <laughs> I should have had you with me in November, Julie, because I had a local author who is a, uh, oh, what's going to kill me because I can't remember what he does, but he's like, he does martial arts too. So we were talking about like writing fight scenes. Next time mm -hmm. we do that, we'll have to bring you in too because that was a lot of fun to talk about. I'm, I'm learning um, fencing and archery hopefully next year. So that's going to be fun too. Oh, nice. Like so one ones. more question for you, Matthew, because mm -hmm. you mentioned that your draft zero is, you know, tens of thousands of words. And uh, granted, you've had, you know, many, many years of experience, but how long does it take you to do that draft zero? Whew, that really depends on the project um, and how much life is going on. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, for Light of the Outsider, which was my last novel, um, that was written over the course of years but if you actually broke down and looked at the actual log time it was maybe nine months oh, you okay. know so uh which is which i'd like to improve upon you know uh i've got uh, uh three novels in print so far and uh a few short stories and uh, my latest work is a novelette um but you know there's certainly a level of productivity that that could be improved upon as far as on average, the, the the planning stage, I mean, we all know that, that writing is, who was it? Was it Stephen King or Neil Gaiman who said it's mostly staring in a black wall? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the percolating stage, I don't really track. Uh, the draft zero stage, for Light of the Outsider, that was one big chunk of work. And I'm going to say it was probably about six weeks. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thanks for that information. That's really helpful for uh, people to get all of your input on that. All right, who wants to tell us about your editing process next? It's a really long process, so I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've written 16 books, but I tend to write shorter, but I also have, um, I think, a different point of view because I'm also an editor. So that's fun. Um, I recently started doing dictation edits, which is an interesting thing to see the difference between how I dictate and how someone else dictates. Um, that's how I get most of my words down. I can do a thousand words in 10 minutes if I'm dictating, but I hate the sound of my own voice. So that's fun. Um, so honestly, the difference for me between plotter and painter, it just depends um, a lot of times. I will have a cover before I have the book mm -hmm. and I come up with the idea to go with the cover. So if I do it that way, then I will normally, um, I do just the main points of the story. And I feel like that gives me an idea of what I want to go through, but it give, also gives me enough freedom to be able to move. You know, if I change my mind somewhere in there, you know, I haven't written myself into a corner yet. Um, and then I have some where they're just my fun projects where I just write whatever I feel like writing. Um, and those I write out of order and it drives people nuts. 
because I just write chunks here and there and it drives people nuts. But um, those I don't plot. I just write whatever I feel like writing and that's how they get done. So. Well, cool. So um, when you're doing like your outline and your first draft, about how long does that take you to do for the ones that you're actually planning? For the ones that I'm actually planning, I can do the um, outline for um, anywhere between 15 to 30 chapters in a half an hour to an hour. Um, and I can usually get the rough draft of the book done in anywhere from two weeks to a month, depending on how many editing clients I have. So when I first started writing, I wrote my first book when I was 14 and I didn't publish until I was 18. But when I was young, I was writing, um, full books in two weeks in a notebook and I miss that. <laughs> My hand, ooh, that makes my hands cramp just thinking about it. Ooh. Probably why I have problems with my hands now. <laughs> I have nerve damage and I have um, bone growths in both of oh. my wrists. Oh no. So that's also part of the reason for the dictation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be very helpful. So I think you mentioned that you do a, a dictation edit too. Um, so what's that like? Um, so dictation edits are, um, I help other authors with their dictations because a lot of times, especially with fantasy, dictation does not like certain names and certain things. So my job is to go through and figure out what they were trying to say. Um, it's, it's very interesting to see the difference between how people dictate. Like I'm from Ohio and I guess I have less of an accent than some people because my dictation drafts are relatively clean. And then there are some peoples that I work on where it's very hard to tell what they were saying. And it's also very interesting to see where, like I shut mine off if I'm done, but some people just keep talking through it. Like they'll talk to their yeah. dog, they'll say, um, like, <laughs> like. Um, so it's just funny to me to um, see the differences in how people dictate. I hate the sound of my own voice, so I stop it unless I'm actually writing. And then I turn it back. <laughs> I, I think that's common that everyone hates the sound of their voice because I know I do. Although I'm on TikTok a lot. So like it's breaking the habit of hating my own voice because I have to hear it all the time to like edit my little stupid videos and stuff. But um, but I, I was asking about the dictation because I use the caption feature, like the auto caption feature on TikTok. And it is always like, especially with anything fantasy related, it's putting in like crazy stuff. So I was curious oh, yeah. with your dictation edit about that. So it's good to know like, it's like across the board, it can't figure us out. Yeah, like I have a client now, um, there's a character named Trina and it says it's trainer everywhere in the book. It's trainer. Oh no. And then um, there's Matt, which is a rel relatively normal name. Like that's not a fantasy name. That should be, and it's Matt, Matt everywhere in the book. So. One, one trick, one trick that I've heard from uh, some other authors who do dictation in fantasy, is that they have a a normal name for the person when they're yes. dictating, and then do a search and replace afterwards to replace John with the uh, you know whatever his weird name is. <laughs> oh yeah, I do that too. Yeah, that is a good trick. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that, Julia. That's really interesting. All right. Let's go to your next door neighbor, Russell. Russell, tell us about your editing process. I feel like my process is so boring compared to the other two people. So um, <laughs> I, I, I hate plotting, but the old, I've written 23 books in the past two years. And the only time I had a break uh, where I couldn't write was the two months that I did not plot the book. So like, I literally cannot not plot that uh, uh, if I want to continue productivity. And I think when you're deciding whether you are a pantser or a plotter, a lot of times it comes down to how productive you want to be because for, for most of the people that I know, they, they, they are much faster when they plot the book out, at least for a day beforehand, at least when they do the major beats of what they're trying to get to um, because then they don't have to so much stop and think about it in the moment. So I am a plotter. I have a beat sheet with every thousand words and I say what, every thousand words is going, what's going to happen every thousand words. I bold every 5,000 and 10,000 as like the major plot beats um, that I can't miss, but at least every 10,000. Sometimes I don't do the 5,000 word beat, but I always have to hit the 10,000 and especially the 20,000 word beats. Um, it helps me plan when the twists are going to happen in the book. 
But oftentimes, uh, on the other side of plotting, uh, I tend to go off outline quite a bit, except when I am hitting major plot beats. Um, to me, it's just, I need to know like what the next piece is. The other thing that helps me with plotting a novel is when you have the major beats, you can work out to in. And often it's very helpful for me to say, okay, this is the main, this is where we are. This is the next major plot beat. Like what has, what are the, what is the next thing that has to happen from 10,000 to 9,000 for like that to happen? And then I can work this way, which often helps my brain. I used to do that a lot with comics. Um, so I have a beat, a, a sort of a beat sheet like that, a crib sheet, if you will. Uh, usually I have, I finished four, all four of my major worlds this year, uh, but I would spend about a year building the world in a sketchbook. So I would, uh, I would uh, talk about like the major areas of the world, uh, the, 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 uh, who is in control of it, like whatever major plot beats that I wanted to hit um, for about, takes about a year or two years. Uh, I tend to not do that in, in books that don't have at least 10 books planned in it, though. So if it's a one book or two book arc, I'm I'm pretty much not doing that. I just can I'll wing it during the time, especially if it's a world I don't plan on going to again. I have a series that's coming out in January called uh, Dragon Stripe, which is dragons. And I knew that it, I wanted to have the main character be a uh, sacrifice and then her to meet this dragon and find out that everything that like she's ever been taught about dragons is wrong. And like, uh, and so, and then that like changes the whole world. And I knew that I kind of knew that there was 11 or 13 dragons in the world and that gods, but like I had like four or five beats. And then uh, because it was a very small story, I knew that I, I could just figure it out. Um, when it's a very big story, I have a universe called the gods, um, the Obsidian Spindle Saga, which is five point of views, every book in different, as they're in different realms, uh, as they're like doing different things. And like, that is much harder for me to do without having like a big Bible. Um, uh, so I generally start with a sketchbook, then move to beat sheet. Um, often I will beat sheet like the whole arc. So my books tend to happen in three or four book arcs. And so I'll plan out generally what's going to happen in each arc in each book. And then I'll plan each book. And then I have a very boring process. It takes me three weeks to write and edit a 50,000 word book. Sorry, 60,000, 50 or 60,000 word book. It takes me five weeks to write a 90,000 word book and edit it. Uh, and it's just from 23 books. I can tell you that hits every single time. That's exactly how long it takes. I do. I used to do when I was doing I my first book, eight edit passes. Um, I'd write a thousand, I used to write a thousand words a day and then I would do eight edit passes. And as time went on, I have, I cut edit passes as they no longer served me as, so I, I, I'd be like, well, I'm li literally not doing very much between seven and eight. So like, I'm just going to have seven passes now. And I've gotten it down to, uh, two edit passes that I really do pretty vigorously. And then one that I just am checking formatting, which people don't tell you, you should absolutely do this before, when you finish a book, you should look and see how pretty it is on a page when you flip through it, because <laughs> like you might realize you have 10 pages that are just one block of text for 10 pages. And like, that is not good. It's not pretty. People will put down your book. So I always do that final pass just to look through also to take out curse words and a couple of other things that I do at the end. Um, but the other thing is I have an editor that I really love and I've worked with for 20 plus books. Uh, so I feel I don't, and I, and I have a proofreader who's read like all 30, 40, 50, like so many projects now that like I trust them implicitly that I don't have to like look over their shoulder every page or everything. And I know where they're going to get it, which is how I've been able to cut drafts. So when I've cut, when I cut drafts, I'm always like, well, like this is like, Leah's going to fix it. Like Leah will like, like this is at the point that like Leah will do her thing now. And so, I mean, I've written now 37 books and it's a lot different when I wrote book one and book 37. And that's, you know, as if you're listening to this and you've not written a book, you've only written a couple. Like I can tell you like that your process gets more defined as you understand what like a, a chapter looks like for you. Because, you know, a lot of 
you kind of become like a book whisperer when you like have written so many books where you're like, oh, like this chat, this book series is going to be like a thousand to three thousand words a chapter. And like generally, you know, like this is like, oh, how do I get to the next chapter? OK, these are the plot points. These are the ways that I like to twist the thing. Like these are the turns that I like. And part of how you get faster and I write now five thousand words a day is like just kind of knowing what like the editing beats are. And once you've written so many books, I mean, I'm sure uh, Pamela down there can has written like over 70 books. I, I mean, I'm sure it's something like this is similar to like, yeah. I just got really, really good at knowing like what a story that I liked to tell is and what the flow is and being able to like move a story around, like manipulate it, bec become an active participant in writing the book instead of just listening to the voices in my head. And so the editing just got a lot smoother over time until like, it's, it's honestly pretty boring now. Like I, I get a book, I write the book in uh, 5,000 words a day times however many work days there are. So somewhere between 10 and 14 work days. And then I take a day off, I edit 20,000 words, 20 to 25,000 words a day until that book is done. And then I do a second pass where I do, I try and do the whole book in one day because I want to see all of the pieces and make sure they all connect. Continuity, yeah. Yes, and I find I can only do that if I read the whole book in one go. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do the one like final kind of like, does this look pretty? Are there a thousand F-bombs? Like I need to take all of these things out. Uh, and then I send it to my editor. <laughs> um, and then my editor does like her thing. We do two passes with my editor, one with my with a proofreader. I've started with a second proofreader now just to make sure because even when you have a person who is professionally proofreading your book, like there will still be errors. Um, mm -hmm. I found that most most big houses like do two editor have two proofreaders. And so I have started doing that as well. And I think that it's working out pretty well. Uh, uh, you, you know, if you have a sieve of like your copywriter is going to probably miss a lot because that's not their job. My, <laughs> my copy editor has said specifically, like, it is not my job to proofread this book. Like I'm getting this to, to write, like go hire a proofreader. And so like I hire a proofreader, but like some things will, will miss through them. Some things will miss through me when I read it again. And then some things will miss through my second proofreader. But you know, the more it ends up costing a lot more, obviously to have like three or four pairs of eyes on the book, but I think it ends up being a better product. And when you are making a book that's going to live and for me, for me, like some people are way better editors than me. I should say, like I have friends that like are amazing and they can get like one proofread, one content pass and maybe not even a proofreader and like, it'll be perfect. But like my books, my, my books are hot garbage when they go to the editor and like they have to, I know I have to do a lot to like make it like kind of fit together and so I need to have that many sort of passes on it. And that's why I love this idea of this panel, because everyone's process is different. And I think the longer you do it, the more you kind of find what's organic to you. Is it like having the one editor? Is it having a dozen editors? Like, how do you deal with your workflow? Yep. Yep. So I'm interested in your uh, your formatting that you were talking about. Do you do your own formatting like with vellum or do you have like someone else do that part for you? I actually do it in Word. Oh, oh, you are oh. great. Uh, I thought with Word for a week and I gave up and threw money at vellum. <laughs> so I will, so I got a, a when, I, when I used to not do my own books uh, and I had publishers do them, I got a template from my publisher like 10 years ago and like it still works and so like i changed the headings and everything but like yeah i do it myself i do the ebooks through draft to digital i have atticus but just it does not work for me i don't know why i can't get this thing to work it seems so easy but like every time it looks terrible when i finish it and so i end up just going back to draft to digital and using one of the five templates that they have do, do you do your print layouts in word yeah Yep. That's impressive. Yeah, I've, I've done it a couple of times. And <laughs> I, I, I use uh, Affinity Publisher, which is like a, a $50 pay once yeah. uh, updates forever program. And I and you've got a template and it works for you. But yeah, if anybody's starting out, I, I wouldn't recommend using a word processor to lay out your print or your ebooks for that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah, well, uh, it's a it's a round hole square peg kind of thing. <laughs> I get a lot of I get a lot of flack from my friends in comics because I format books in, in Adobe 
an Adobe Acrobat, which like everyone like gets on me for. I have pub <laughs> I have Affinity Publisher as well, but like, mm -hmm. like I don't know. Like we all have a process that works oh, yeah. for us, and like yeah. I guarantee, I'll bet if all six of us put out our whole process, like <laughs> every one of us would be like, I can't believe you do this this way. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. like you were talking about the big chunks or whatever about how you check your formatting and stuff. My friend Jennifer does all my formatting, and she hates the way I do it. She's like, Why you do this? <laughs> like I don't, I don't even I don't even know like I'm very not tech savvy so I don't even know what she was talking about but I was like okay but I think it was something about the spacing and she's like why have you oh it's um it's my spacing at the beginning of them I I put five spaces with the space bar in in front of all my things and she's like why have you done this <laughs> Oh, yeah. Okay. See, there you go. There's another one that uh, horrifies like, me. Like, like when people send me something that is 0.5 indented from the thing, like it, I, like, I literally, I, I have like a, my brain can't think, can't, can't like do it. Like, I can't. You just like have know, a hot I, flash. Like, what have you I, done? Like, I look at it. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Well, this is happening now. <laughs> We'll have to have another panel on formatting. <laughs> Wait, we might have to. That'd be a fun topic. It looks like. I just. Yeah, it's it's interesting you like... mentioned uh, Atticus Russell because I I, ju I jumped on it when it was in the beta, and That's I found right. out there's two problems with it that I I had. Like number one, like I wanted to use it for print, like you were going to do, but it doesn't when you preview it. It's just one long, like forever page, which you know, Epic Fantasy. It's like, oh, it's just, it's like like a CVS receipt pretty much for your book. Um, and then I found that a bug that I had to send to their developers. So because I write fantasy, I have telepathic Pegasus and we use the little like carrot things. And so whenever my Pegasus would start talking, they would literally eat my book because Atticus thought it was code. So I'm like, <laughs> why, why is half my book missing? And I found <laughs> my very hungry Pegasus ate like an entire chapter. Yeah. So I have a very uh, tiny formatting thing with, with Atticus that like makes breaks it for me is I send my books. I do a lot of Kickstarter. That's how mm -hmm. I make most of my money. And like I send books to, to, to people in PDFs. I send PDFs to people like the eBooks. And Atticus puts like, uh, like offsets the, the book like you would print it. And I don't want them to do that. And I cannot figure out how to make them to not do it. And so it like breaks yeah. my brain and I can't, I just, I'm just like, okay, I guess I'm not doing this then. I'm just not smart enough for Atticus. There's no real problem. The problem it's, is me. It's um, not you. <laughs> it's not you. No, I don't know. I didn't try. It's not ready. It's not ready for prime time. And yeah, uh, it'll probably get better. Of course. Them, yeah. But for sure. now. Yeah. Yeah. I got um, a Mac because I also designed covers. So I was like, why not vellum? So it, it just went on sale and I was like, gotta. <laughs> yeah. I'm very jealous. I almost I got a new <laughs> laptop recently and I like almost bought a Mac, even though I hate Macs, just to get Vellum. I got it just because I also design book covers. And so I'm like, all right, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. And then there, everybody was like, All right, you need this much RAM and you need this much gigabytes. And I was like, I don't know what we're talking about. So <laughs> So this looks okay, and it runs what I need it to run. And I'm like, all right, cool. And I can format. We're good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a all right, awesome. Well, let's go on to Pamela. Let's hear about your editing process with all of your books you've written. Yeah, well, and, and over time, as uh, Russell says, you do uh, develop systems and kind of get to know, know yourself and what works. But I'm always trying to improve on stuff and change as well. So... So you also have tweaks here and there, and and if you're putting out books regularly, then you can uh, test things out pretty quickly and and see what works and not. So, um, so like Julie, uh, I wrote my first book when I was 12. I did not publish until I was 40. <laughs> so <laughs> there was a big gap in there. I I only wrote for myself for my own entertainment, and I said, you know, somebody else can publish all my books after I die. And so, so it wasn't until quite a bit later on that I decided that uh, I wanted to write stuff for the public, for an audience, and start publishing. So, uh, so most of the stuff that I wrote in those in those first thirty years was completely unpublishable. You know, it was just it was just for me. It's not a genre appropriate. It would have to be com they'd have to be completely rewritten uh, to be published for a real audience. So. Uh, so 
for all of that time, um, I did not plot. I completely pantsed. And if a story started here and went somewhere weird, that was fine. You know, <laughs> it didn't matter to me. I'd just write it for as long as I was interested and then kill everybody off and start a new book. <laughs> but readers apparently don't like it when you kill everybody off at the end <laughs> or in the middle. Um, yeah, so I, for so I, R. R. Martin. I mean, come on, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> of the story. <laughs> and I would, um, you know, I, I thought it would be a good idea to outline and plan ahead of time. Uh, but any time that I started doing that, I would get bored with the book and decide I'm not writing this and start on something else. So I, I wasn't very uh, consistent or disciplined for, uh, for those first few decades that I was writing. Um, so now it's completely different. Now I outline just about every book. There's been a, a couple that I'll do every year or two where I go, okay, this one, I'm just going to pants it. Uh, a particular series or, or that kind of thing that this one, I, I just don't want to plan it. I'm just going to jump right in. But so yeah, generally I will plan. Um, I give myself uh, a week for, of, of planning for each book for each month to do the research, the planning, the, the covers, all of that kind of thing. I do um, kind of the last week of the month so that I'm ready to start my next book on the first of the month, um, write 5,000 words a day, or if it's a long book, then I'll write 6,000 words a day. Uh, and then, so I finish around the 19th to the 23rd each month, I write six days a week. And uh, so then when I've got, First draft done, then I will do a, a couple of edits, uh, one for grammar, one for uh, continuity. Then I put it aside for 30 days while I work on the next one. So I'll come back to it after 30 days and, and do another edit. And then generally I, I'll usually have one or two more edits um, before I get it ready for my editor, do another quick run through, spell check, all of that kind of thing, send it off to my editor. And so when I get it back from him, go through his changes, get it all ready for my advanced readers, send it out to them. And then if they have uh, changes as well, then I'll catch those before I do uh, the final publishing on it. So they can go through uh, like six to eight drafts probably on average. And I am writing one a month, so generally after I've after I've done my first draft, I've usually got three or four other books that I'm editing as well. So I'll I'll edit three to five books a month, as well as as well as my writing, and and then start over again. Wow! So you keep busy. So from the point when you're writing the book, about how long does it go? Like from a uh, starting up the writing process to actually publishing it, just to give people kind of an idea of what what that's like yeah. for you at this point. Generally six to eight months between when I write it and when I publish it, just because I have, you know, I have so many in, in the pipeline at a time. And I'll, I'll generally write uh, three in a row from one series. Uh, that helps to keep me going and keep me from having to go back and read the series again before I write the next one. So I'll generally write three in a series uh, and then I'll have them scheduled for some time out in the next few months and, and write the next few. So I've got, I think, the, hmm, I think I've got about the next nine scheduled right now. So really? I'm scheduled really? most of the way through next year. Wow, that's awesome. Good was, for you. What was that, Julie? I have eight for next year. So I feel that I'm trying to publish um, once a month next year um, through, and that'll get me through like July. And then I plan to and the second half of the year with two trilogies. So hopefully that will work. Yeah, yeah, I should have, I'll have 14 next year. So that's, um, uh, that's, what, that's 11 uh, full length and three novella. Um, plus I'm republishing one of my old series with new name, new cover, new editing. So that's three more for that one. So 17 next year plus box sets and whatever else. I admire all y'all for being able to do series because I have commitment issues and I just, it just don't work that well. So well, you can I'm, do an anthology series, like is what my first series was, which every book is a different person. And then I, you, have, <laughs> you have all the commitment issues you want, which is, I have the same issue. 
I'm doing that next year, I think. Um, I have one called Crystal Dark, and it's been one of my best sellers, but it was never intent because of the pretty color cover, and it was never intended to be um, a series, but it's a Hades and Persephone retelling. So mm. I'm doing mm. uh, a series of different um, Greek myths. I'm doing um, the Minotaur. I'm doing um, Narcissus, and I'm thinking about Icarus, so... We'll see. And maybe Medusa. We'll see. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think Emma does it really smartly with the with the series because I'm writing, I don't know how many books are going to be in the series, but I'm working on the third one now. And I'm having the trouble where like I'm having to do like the thing that like World of Warcraft has to do, like like retconning my own lore and like, oh yes, in the first book, this is the why character just didn't know about <laughs> this thing. <laughs> Like that's how I'm like, yeah, the character didn't know, wink wink. It was it wasn't me, it was the character. Yeah, I didn't get it wrong. <laughs> yeah, they repainted the, the car, okay? The car changed color because they repainted it. <laughs> I just yeah, had so that, somebody... that's, that's smart to write the whole thing and then like fix the continuity errors and stuff, but I'm too yeah. impatient. I had to like I wanted my name on a book in my hand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I have finally started keeping a, a series wiki for each of the series so that I can keep track of stuff better. And um, yeah, my, my longest series so far is 18 books. So wow. you, you do have to kind of keep track of some of those things because some of them are really hard to go back and search. Okay, which book was that in? What was his name? What was What was a phrase I can search for to find exactly that piece of information? So yeah, anytime I look something up go to my series wiki and write it down so that next time i don't have to search it out again we should do a program on that too because i have like a i made an excel sheet so i've got all the tabs but i i made something similar because i kept like having to go reread my books and, and it's a problem for me because the first two books i <clears throat> literally rewrote them so i forgot what happened between the first draft and the actual thing that happened so yeah so that that's very helpful yeah yeah, yeah. I use OneNote for my series. If anybody, that's helpful. That's nice. And I just blow up wherever the place is before they come back to it. That's my rule. Is like <laughs> characters can't come back to a city. Of course, it doesn't look the same. Yeah, it doesn't look the same because it's blown up. And once they're gone, they can only hear stuff third hand. And that's how I. It's like history literally got rewritten in that dystopian, crazy world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting when you if you start putting in some. Uh put in some time travel and uh you know shift back and change what actually happened so yeah it's interesting it's interesting <laughs> to me the how people react to like time travel and stuff like that because like i literally have written books where i was like i'm not smart enough for the science so i made it magic like i wrote one called a force of thunderbirds because i really like top gun and i'm like i am not smart enough and Top Gun and Iron Eagle, and I was like, I'm not smart enough to do, um, like, all of the science and stuff. So it's literally, instead of um, fighter planes, they have Thunderbirds. Like, actual Thunderbirds. Oh, birds. Right. Nice. <laughs> and they um, have elemental powers. They use their lightning to control the Thunderbirds because I was not smart enough to write the machines. So... <laughs> Uh, I I only have one series out right now that includes time travel, and she finds out that nothing that anybody speculated about time travel <laughs> is true. So that that just you know, yeah. She said you know she's always watched Star Trek, and she thought she knew how it worked, and yeah, it was totally <laughs> wrong. <laughs> well, that's fun. All right. Well, now we're going to go to um, some of our newest authors to talk about how we edit. So, Terilyn, while we have you before your internet decides to take you away from us. T tell us how you okay. edit your works. <laughs> okay, so like I said, I am a newer author and I kind of fell into writing and publishing. Um, in 2017, I decided to put my books on like a Wattpad thing and they, can you guys hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're sure. okay. A little quiet, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'll talk up, sorry. Um, so basically I put all my books on, I think, because I needed money um they're just the truth of it i just decided to publish them because i was writing mostly for myself i didn't plan to publish until i was like in my 40s after i had a career so i put them on there and then the people they decided to give me a publishing contract for my first book which published in november of 2017. before that i was a panster 
and I rewrote that book like two or three times before I even sent it to them and I realized I can't do that anymore I can't just rewrite each book like I write it yeah. and then rewrite it because it doesn't make sense so I started plotting now um I have I have that book published and I've published like three or four self-published books and I know I plot everything. So from the beginning, I try to plot out the whole series because like you said, continually, like they are interconnected standalones because it's romance. But if they're sisters, I just need to know who they with and who is their spouse, who is the kids. And I just try to keep like a long Google Docs form that basically tells me like who is with who, who their kids are, who what their ages are, because ages is the thing that takes me forever. I don't know <laughs> why, like trying to figure out how, like from the first book to their book, how old they are and how yes. old everyone is. So it's really annoying. So I have my calculator, I'm trying to figure out, trying to see if it works. And I found that sometimes I mess it up. So, and um, I've just, I'm re like trying to do my schedule right now for 2022. And I just learned that it takes me three and a half months to get from first draft to publishing the book. So what I do, it takes me about four to six weeks to write the first draft. And then I send it to a paid beta reader, which is kind of like a critique partner, but I'm paying them. And I know that they're going to get it back to me and give me like real feedback because I paid them for it. And when they do that, it takes me a month to go through it and fix everything they said, add words. Sometimes I'll send it to them. It's like, 60,000 by the time I'm done is 90,000. So I had like a lot of words to it. And then I send it to the copy editor because I use a lot of like professional people because even though I was an editor, when I know how it works, I can't read my own stuff. I miss things all the time. Mm -hmm. So like I'll send it to the copy editor, they keep it for a couple of weeks and then I get it back. I only keep it for two weeks then. And at that point I'll either like go through it and listen to it if I'm not tired of the book yet, or I will just go through it and use like a program where I can find out if I'm using a lot of adverbs or anything like that. And that really helps me and go through Grammarly and then go through that and then send it to the proofreader. They usually keep it about a week. And if I haven't listened to it, when I get it back then, I'll listen to it, fix everything, and then it's ready to be published. So that's kind of my process. And like right now, I feel like I'm getting into a point where I know what my process is. So it's making it easy to schedule but I'm still debating about the paid beta reader, um, depending on how it goes as I get more experience, I guess. And that's it for me. Awesome, so, so what program tells you about the adverb? Is, is that a part of Grammarly? No, so I was using the free Grammarly and they don't tell you anything. I just mm -hmm. bought Pro Writing Aid, the lifetime one with a discount that I have, that they have 50% off. But the app I use is called Hemingway app. Mm -hmm. And I bought it a long time ago. Um, I don't even know if they still sell it, but I bought it and I never used it until last year when I started writing. I was writing in another author's world and I had to make things a lot faster. Um, mm -hmm. I had a deadline for that. So I downloaded it. It was a one-time payment and it updates and that's what I use. And it's something that you put on your computer and I just slap the chapter in there, take out, like they'll tell me you have like, 20 adverbs try to be less than 15 or something like that. So I'll just yeah. take them out. If anything's convoluted, they tell me, and then I'll put it in Grammarly, fix it, and then put it back in and move on to the next chapter. And I do go chapter by chapter and then try to listen to the book all the way through or read it all the way through once, but continue, like just making sure that everything makes sense. Yeah. Cool. That, that's good to hear about Hemingway because I use pro writing it. I bought like the full lifetime thing because I got sold mm -hmm. on how awesome it was. Um, but I don't think it, well, it's got lots of different modules. I don't think it has an adverb thing. That's good to know that Hemingway does. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I will go last since I'm the, the baby author among us. Um, <laughs> and I'm the one who's going to give like any new writers hope that you actually can like write a book and publish it. Um, because I probably have the messiest process of us all. Um, I, I tried really hard for my, I tried for my first two books to plot both of them. And I used Save the Cat and I had the beats. And then my characters literally have minds of their own and I would start writing something. And then they're like, no, this is not what I would do. So they would go off script. Um, so what I ended up doing with the third book, which um, maybe my draft zero is just 116,000 words of draft, draft zero, um, but that was what, what I wrote in November for NaNoWriMo. Um, and what I did after my, my uh, outline of 116,000 words is I did a read through um, where I took notes from each scene just so I would know what happened. Um, that gave me kind of a big picture view of like scenes that are missing, 
because when I was writing the draft zero, sometimes I didn't feel like writing a certain scene or a certain character. So I'm like, eh, I'll, I'll write them later because I don't feel, feel like them right now. Um, but also I was fitting my draft zero in around, you know, my 40 hour a week librarian job, my four year old and my seven year old. And, you know, they, they have to eat and sleep and stuff like that. You know, so apparently. Um, <laughs> um, so for, for the, the mom writers out there, um, you can do it. I also didn't publish till I was over 40. So, um, you know, it's, it's possible, you know, we have three of us who've proven that at the very least. Um, so I do my read through, take my notes. And then from my notes, that's actually when I start doing my actual outline of what happened, because then I can see, um, I think it was kind of like Russell was talking about for this to happen, this other thing has to happen. And that's where I can kind of finagle with my engineering with that. Um, so then what I'm going to be doing next, because I'm actually in the next part, which is where um, I'm in the draft now, filling in the, the scenes that are missing, um, adding some of, some of the details, like, you know, I didn't talk about, you know, someone's hair color, because my, my drafts, you were also like, you don't know what anybody looks like. Although I, I still don't describe them that well. Like I'm, I'm not a descriptive writer. Like you might have, you might get some details to have an idea at least, but I'll, I'll try to add details in, in my, this draft I'm doing. Um, and, you know, add my changes. Then after this draft, um, that's when I'll plug it into pro writing aid because I love pro writing aid. It, it helps me not be passive and all of that stuff that I really want to be apparently. Um, and then after that, I'll read it again and I'll ship it off to my betas. Um, hopefully they'll like it and tell me, you know, stuff that doesn't work. And then after I get the feedback from them, um, I have added again. And after I have added again, then it goes to my professional editor too. Um, then she usually, she's always given me really good feedback. So then I have to change some things. Then after I change things, then I do my audio edit where I have an app called Edit Out Loud. And it's one of those horrific, robot voices but for some reason the horrific robot voice aside from butchering my fantasy names makes it so I can actually like find like oh I'm missing a word here or this makes no sense mm -hmm. um so that's like my or the the <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so I, I have a lot of luck with the weird robot audio edit voice and I know some people um no one on this panel mentioned it but I've heard some people use the feature in word that it'll read to you too for edits that's what I do too yeah, yeah. that's what I use I use word oh cool mm -hmm. yeah so I, I like that for the audio edit. I like to use it on Edit Out Loud because I can put it on my phone and like I literally, um, with my first book breaker, I spent an entire weekend cleaning the house while I was listening to the audio edit. And like when I would hear like something wrong, I would pull out my phone and like stop it and like make the little note of like, oh, I had the word the twice in a row here. Then I would go back to cleaning the house. And like, I had the cleanest house for like, you know, for, for well, when I was done for like 15 minutes because I had kids, but you know, I had yeah. the cleanest house for a short time after the audio edit, which was awesome. Um, I think it's interesting. You talked about our ages. We have such a wide range of ages. I feel so young. <laughs> I published when I was 18. I published my first book when I was 18. I hit the USA Today bestseller list at 19, and I just turned 22 uh, last week. So, and I have 16 oh, wow. books out. So it's so interesting to see the difference in yeah. everybody's ages and their processes yeah. and yeah. stuff. Well, so, like for me, I, I wrote a lot, but it was before the days of like indie publishing back when it was really hard to get, you know, actually into trad publishing. You had to send out query letters. <laughs> I did yeah. that too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, mm. my first sale was, I think, 1997. Um, and then I had one of the first uh, online magazines a periodical uh in like 98 99 but yeah it, it's when it, when i first did brave men run my first novel in 2005 uh, there was no kindle <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, know, tried, um, I tried um to get an agent and i tried to get a publisher with my first book and then i actually just signed a publishing contract with in between my 15th and 16th books. So it just goes to show you that if mm -hmm. you decide you want to do it, you can do both because yeah. Yeah. I yeah, didn't absolutely. plan yeah. on, I didn't think it would go anywhere. I just kind of wanted to be like, okay, does anybody even like it? And then they asked for the full manuscript and then they said, yeah, we'd like to publish it. So yeah. it's awesome. slotted in there in the middle. Yeah, when I was getting started, it was, it was wild west and, and indie publishing and podcasting were, were both, brand new 2004 2005 and uh uh yeah it was such a perfect storm that that 
I was getting calls from publishers. <laughs> it's like, no, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. And then um, actually there was a second edition of my first book that was done through uh, their, it was, a, I think Permuted Press is still around. They had a little imprint called Swarm Press for a while. And me and Mer Lafferty, who uh, uh, probably at least one person in this panel knows who Mer Lafferty is, but she's a uh, uh, Hugo Award winner and uh, does, does Star Wars tie-in books and things like that these days. But back then we're like, sure, we'll try this thing. But it was all because we were doing our own marketing and doing our own promotion um, and making it up as we went along, you know? Um, and so, yeah, you never know what's going to happen out there. <laughs> and I think it's also a difference between like how we decide to do it. Like I think most all of us, I use, I pick my cover designer and I pick each of these things and stuff. But when I was first starting out, I was like 16 and 17 and I was like, okay, so the way to go is to pay one person to publish it. And now, and I looked into it and I was working a summer job and I was thinking I was going to pay somebody like $10,000 or something to publish my book. So it's very different. The approaches yeah. when you're new to when you're into it. And also like once you break into um, publishing, I think a lot of times people are really helpful. Like we've all had a good conversation here and I think it's very interesting. Like people will be like, no, 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 don't do that. You can do this, this, and this that'll help. Mm -hmm. It's a very, mm -hmm. it's a very nice. And we should also get a quick PSA. If someone wants you to pay them to publish your book, do I not do that. Don't, yeah, do don't it. Do it. <laughs> you can pay yeah. for services, but publishers yeah, will not ask that. you for money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one thing to do the individual services and it's one it's another thing to for one person to be like, okay, we're gonna do everything. I'll publish your book, give me money. <laughs> and you have to have fifteen thousand books sitting in your your garage or something. Like, please don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I will do everything, but I'm not going to call myself a publisher. It, it's, it's, you know, I can, I can help somebody from developmental <laughs> edit to uploading their stuff on Amazon, uh, yeah. which is what I do for a living. You know, everything mm -hmm. from A to Z. Um, yeah, and that's different yeah, because it, you're an actual service. You're not like the shady well, exactly. publishers. You know, yeah, or one of these publishing farms. You know, I, I have mm -hmm. an author client who uh, came to me for marketing and working with this publishing farm that they got signed to. You know, I mean, great. They, they, they published the book and they're not asking this author for any money, but they also published 90 other books this month. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so right away, wow. it's like, well, you're on your own, pal. You know, it's you and me because uh, <laughs> they're not going to help. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. So, yeah, I definitely. And the, the, the point is good. You know, there's so many resources these days on Facebook alone. Um, for Price new writers yeah. to to find the the white hats out there who will who lead them the right way, and also just to remember that context is everything. You know what's going to work in one genre, in one yeah. niche mm -hmm. genre, 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 sub 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 genre is going to be different. You know, uh, we may all be in some of the same Facebook groups, and a lot of times you'll see a question like, "How do I market my book?" Well, you got to give us a little more than that. You got to tell mm -hmm. us. Because advice for a romance book is going to be very different. You know, even editing advice for one genre yeah, to another yeah. is going to be very yeah. different. Um, yeah. I'm going to try to not stay on my soapbox. For <laughs> <laughs> it's a very fine soapbox. <laughs> Are there well, any awesome. questions We're from the, the about the end of our time. But I, I do want to thank um, all of our viewers for tuning in and watching. Um, and I especially want to thank all of our authors today who joined us. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, anybody have any last comments y'all want to make before uh, we end this? Uh, I, I wanted to mention that as far as uh, outlining goes, you know, we all have different uh, outlining processes here that we talked about. My Mine is a fairly short, you know, I may have a one or a two page outline mm -hmm. and stuff gets moved around. I never have the I never have the third act plotted. You know, they solved the murder. That's my third act. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who the killer is till I get over <laughs> there. But uh, you know, so so planning and plotting can be anywhere on the spectrum from you know mm -hmm. 
three notes on a on a sticky for this is the beginning, yeah. middle, and end to you know those of you who are doing tens of thousands of words of, of plotting. Mm -hmm. And then stuff can change too along the way. You find that something doesn't work or or a character is something new that you hadn't thought about or, or that kind of thing. And I think it's it's so important to, to kind of stress that that when we say outlining or plotting or planning, uh, people hear the word outline, especially new authors, they hear the word outline and they, they flash back to high school. Wait, you mean Roman numeral? A, one, one two, oh. three, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it feels restrictive to them and it feels constraining. And mm -hmm. no, the point of the outline, and, and Russell touched on this, you know, you have your tent pole scenes and the room between those tent poles is is where these out these the outline can help the planning can help you know you have to get you know from your inciting incident to the top of the of the first act to you know the, the various mm -hmm. stages on through so the outline as pamela said can be anything you want it to be it's there to help you it's not it, it's the scaffolding yeah. You know, to give you the room and the flexibility to do the art part, because when the outline is set up, when the planning is set up, that's that's your architecture. You know, yeah. and the rest is yeah. that's the craft. Helps and you then, helps you not to get lost and not to panic and not, exactly. You know, yeah, you you always gives you know something to look at. Right. What well, and I do. think I think also certain genres are are less you less need an outline because the tropes are so strong. So, like for <laughs> instance, in a mm -hmm. In a romance, like you're always going to have a meet cute, and like a, a murder yeah. and murder mysteries, there's always going to be like a a, a a a a a crime, and then a first clue, and then a twist, and then an accusation that like it becomes a false yeah. accusation. Like there's all of these things that become tropes, <laughs> yeah. and so you know, fantasy and sci-fi are two that I think like probably outlines are more important because there's while there's tropes like books are 100 200 300 thousand words long like they have uh, while there's again while there's tropes there's much like it's much looser uh so really uh i i i often say if you're a new writer like try and and you don't want to you don't want to um you don't want to like plot like just try writing something that is like heavily troped so try writing even if you don't like care for murder mysteries like write a crime book write a romance book, like write something because they will get you, it will get you like to understand like the organic rhythm of how like these tropes and how these like stories turn. And the more you can understand organically, like what makes a story, the less, the, the, the more freeing it is when you go and you pants your book or, or, or you do something else like that. Mm -hmm. It's just like any art form. You need to learn the rules before you can stray off. You, you, uh, Orson Welles said the the enemy of creative, how do you put it? Uh, uh, a lack of restraint is the enemy of creativity. You know, you, you need to know where the lanes are so you know when you're leaving them and why. Um, and and tropes are one thing, but but sometimes there's confusion between what a trope is and what a formula is you know yes romance science some science fiction genres uh some fantasy genres the quest the chosen one etc they do have their formulas and that's not a bad word uh it is simply the structure of those stories and understanding story structure it, it, it you can give yourself an mfa in creative writing if you just understand how stories are put together and and read critically and watch uh scripted drama television shows critically mm -hmm. figure out wow why did that make me feel like that right before the second commercial break if you're watching something with commercial breaks yeah. <laughs> and you know how is it that um you know so many writers can be resistant to planning and it's funny this this editorial the editing panel has turned into more about planning or plot, plotting uh, <laughs> it's all interconnected right it, it is exactly yeah, that's yeah. exactly right but you know just recognize if if you're watching this and and you're resistant to planning in one form or another that all of those tv shows that you binge those were all planned all planned ahead of time. They're not sitting down two weeks before they go to camera and figuring out that episode. They know the whole thing <laughs> backwards and forwards, and they know what has to happen when. And it's still good art, those that are good art. Um, yes. so. <laughs> 
And I do want to mention too, this kind of ties in with what you're saying, but it's also important to read in the genres you want to write. And speaking of reading, you'll, uh, our viewers can find books by all of us on the panel, except for Julie. We still need to get one of Julie's books, uh, but they're all available through Harris County Public Library's Overdrive. Um, so you can treat yourself to those books and uh, see some of the things we were talking about, which is really uh, fun to see after uh, listening to us talk. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank y'all all again for joining us. Um, so we really enjoyed the look into everyone's editing process, the, the peek behind the curtain as it was. And um, hopefully we'll have some of you join us for future panels because we've got more exciting things coming up in 2022. And I've got some empty spots on the schedule. So maybe we'll talk about um, like formatting and different fun stuff like that. Um, but as <laughs> for Harris County Public Library, our next HCPL rights program will be on January 11th. And the staff running it are going to talk about morning pages, which I know nothing about. So join us then to find out about that. Or if you can't watch it live, you can check out the recording later. And don't forget to check out all of our great events at www.htpl.net. Happy writing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.